A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. Hello, I'm Tim Farron, and welcome to the show which delves into the mucky business of politics through the eyes of Christians. Now, you might think that politics is tainted by compromise and sin, and of course you would be right, but then again, so is everything else. And I think we should be praying in an informed way for our brothers and sisters who operate in and around the world of politics. Today, we'll be joined by Dr. Krish Kandaya. Krish is an author, broadcaster and social entrepreneur. He currently heads up the Sanctuary Foundation, a charity supporting refugees to find welcome, work and worthwhile housing here in the United Kingdom. We'll discuss how we can give voice to the voiceless within the world of politics. But first, today, and I hope you aren't eating, I want to talk about sewage. Uh, specifically, the tons and tons of raw sewage that water companies are allowed to pump into our lakes and rivers every day. Since 2020, there have been 1.4 million legal sewage dumps in England waterways, totaling a period of 10 million hours. That amounts to 1,100 years. Imagine a continual pouring of sewage into our waters every single day since the Vikings fought the Saxons for control of the land. Well, I've been campaigning on this issue for a quite a while because I see the huge impact that sewage dumping has in my own constituency. Most of the beautiful lakes in my patch are affected. On top of the appalling consequences for our environment and wildlife, it has become a health hazard for people seeking to enjoy water sports or swimming in the likes of Windermere or Coniston. The water companies are finally taking notice of people's anger, but have sparked further controversy through their plans to increase water bills in order to cover the costs of cleaning up the pollution that they have created. However, it's also true that governments of all colours have failed to hold these private companies accountable for the consequences of their negligence over the last 30 years. There have been 960 occasions of illegal sewage dumping in the UK since 2020, but these have led to just 16 prosecutions. So it feels as though the water companies are just factoring into their budget calculations the small risk of a fine, which is far cheaper to them than actually making adequate investment in the sewage and drainage network to avoid those fines. Tim, you say, why are you talking poop again? What's this got to do with Christianity? Well, it's about caring for the natural world. The leading Conservative, Michael Gove, currently Secretary of State for Leveling Up, put it well in his lecture to the Christian think tank Theos in 2018, when he said, for Christians, the ethical responsibility we have towards the environment is encapsulated in the concept of stewardship. Christians are called to remember their rightful place within creation and the vast web of life it created, and their responsibility to protect and defend it. You see, God created a beautiful world for us to live in. He was pleased with all he had made, and he has given us the task of looking after it. I've discussed before the tendency of some in Christian circles to assume that care for creation is not a priority because it does not directly bring people to Christ. Yet our natural world is a pointer to the awesomeness of God. It cannot help singing his praises. Psalm 96 says, let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees, the forests sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord. And Jesus told the Pharisees in Luke 19, verse 40, that if his disciples stop joyfully praising God, the stones will cry out. People are increasingly turning to nature for a sense of peace, awe and perspective that they may not find elsewhere in their lives. In the natural world, we glimpse God's bounty and beauty. In Romans 1, 18 to 20, Paul sets out that humans are without excuse when they turn their backs on God because God has made his existence and his glory clear to everyone through his creation. We are not to worship the environment or any of God's creation, but in worshipping the creator, we are to take care of it. The water companies aren't the only culprits. Much of the pollution in our lakes, rivers and seas comes from industry, from agriculture, and from private septic tanks. And it's right to remember that the water companies are simply operating within a framework that governments and the regulator off what allow them to. So when we level criticism, let's be gracious, proportionate and fair. But let's also be firm that it is not right that the mucky business of politics has failed to regulate the also mucky business of what we do with sewage. Obedience to our God includes caring for the land and the water he created and doing so actively. So let's pray today for everyone involved in stewarding our creation to take this responsibility seriously, whether they are water industry bosses or government ministers, or whether they know God 
or not. A mucky business with Tim Farron. Well, so to our guest this week, Dr. Krish Kandaya. He's an author, broadcaster and founder of the Sanctuary Foundation. Krish, what an honour to have you with us. Hey, Tim, it's a pleasure. Well, let, let's start off with yeah, the most important question, really. Um, you believe in Jesus. How did that happen? Well, I grew up in a mixed race, mixed faith family. My mother uh, was born in India and she'd had a Catholic upbringing, but it was a kind of nominal Catholicism. Um, my father was born in Malaysia to Sri Lankan parents and he had a Hindu upbringing. Hence, my name is Krish, short for Krishna. But it was through a friend at school when I was a teenager, he stood up in our chemistry lab and told the whole class that he had become a friend of God, a Christian. And that was the bravest thing I'd anyone seen anyone do in my life. And I wanted to find out what he had that I didn't. I've been secretly attending church, but I had churchianity rather than a, a living relationship with God. And it was through this lad's witness that my life was changed. And when I became aware that Christianity actually was true, not just for me, but true for everybody. Um, that changed my life. And I tried to share what I knew of Jesus as best I could with my mates. And that started me on a journey to actually understand that, that, that Christianity has reasonable grounds for belief. It, it's not just pie in the sky when you die. It's not just a leap of faith, but it's an informed decision responding mm -hmm. to the evidence that Jesus really is who he said he was. And now following Jesus obviously has practical implications for the choices we make and the things we do in our lives. Amongst the many, many things you do, Chris, um, is you work with the Sanctuary Foundation. And I know you talk a lot about and you act a lot and you care a lot about refugees. Uh, obviously, it's a huge issue at the moment. Um, you and I hear people saying things like this. They'll say, we're a small island. We're full. We can't even house or provide adequate health care for our own people. Aren't we taking our own our fair share already? There's never there's never ending wave of refugees. We can't take them all. Hugh, so what's the answer, the Christian answer to those kind of objections, do you think? So I think Christians are called to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And he was known for his radical hospitality to the people that other people thought were unacceptable. Uh, that that was the, the chief challenge. If you think about the, the most famous parable Jesus ever taught, the parable of the prodigal sons, it was taught because Jesus was welcoming the wrong kinds of people, sinners and tax collectors. And Jesus told this parable to say actually that the heart of God is for those that other people have left behind. And, and for me, this, this whole idea of hospitality has really shaped my theology, my life, my family. We have six children because we're, we're birth parents and we're adoptive parents, we're foster parents. Up until last week, two Ukrainian families were living under our roof. So uh, this, this really matters to us. And, and the best metaphor I can give for this is, look, in our family, we don't allow everybody to come and live with us. You know, there's a limit. There's an elastic limit. If, if we invited a thousand children to come and live in our home, that would be too many. Our, our family would lose its structural integrity. We wouldn't actually be a family anymore. We'd be a, a massive children's home. But our front door, although it's not wide open to allow everybody to come in, it's not jammed shut either. We want to have space to be able to make room for the vulnerable that need us. So that's why we're foster parents. And I think as a nation, we should have a similar approach. You know, we're not saying every displaced person in the world should come and live in the UK. Actually, they don't want to come and live in the UK. Most refugees end up living very close to the countries where they're from. So I was in Aswan recently in Egypt and I didn't meet hardly any. I think out of the 60 or so Sudanese refugees I met that are fleeing the war, only one wanted to come and live in the UK. And that's someone who had family here. So I don't think the UK should or could uh, open its doors to absolutely everybody. That's not what I'm saying. But we ought to be compassionate and gracious to those people that actually need to come here. And that's a smaller number, but it's still a significant number. And we've seen that in the Ukrainian resettlement. Britain has a capacity for incredible generosity. Over 170,000 Ukrainians are living in the UK and many are living with ordinary folk like you and me, Tim. Mm. And it's been transformative. We've, we've done a brilliant job. 
And I just think we shouldn't restrict that hospitality to Ukrainians. I think we should build on what we've done for Ukrainians and offer that same hospitality to the people that really need us. And you talked about your your visit to Egypt recently, um, obviously, and in particular, that focus was on people fleeing the conflict in Sudan. I wonder sometimes whether people's compassion for people from Sudan is because they can't quite relate to what's happening there. They don't know yeah. who the bad guys are, who the good guys are. It's obviously in Ukraine, obviously in Syria and Afghanistan as well, Afghanistan as well. But so point a picture for us. What, what's happening in Sudan and why should we be helping the Sudanese people? So Sudan is in the middle of a really horrific civil war and, you know, it's full on military uh, sides, uh, you know, bombs being dropped from jet airplanes. Um, the, the people I met that had literally stepped off the bus from Sudan and stood in Egypt told me they heard their neighbours screams and they just needed to get out. Some of them just got out with the clothes on their back and it's a uh, food in the shops anymore they've all been looted um they've been looted because people can't access their money the banks have been looted and there's no internet so they can't access internet banking so it's really really desperate situation there one of the reasons i think the uk has special responsibility in sudan is that we drew the borders you know, a, a long time ago in a drawing room in Europe, uh, British people decided where the southern border would go. We used mm -hmm. to rule Sudan and the Egyptians ruled Sudan. So some of that uh, internal fighting was generated by false boundaries that we put in the first place. Uh, the other reason, uh, and this is the, the key one for me, is that there are already a Sudanese population here. And I think this Sudanese population, as I've spoken to them, they would like to be able to host their families. Uh, in their homes. They're not asking for the government to put them up in hotels. They're asking for the permission to be able to host their own families in their homes. L last night, my, my daughter got into a difficult situation in London. I had to go and rescue her. And it was a delight to do it, although it was a bit of a pain. I had to get on a train in the middle of the night and go and pick her up. But that's what families do. We stick together and we look out for one another. And there are Sudanese families here that want that opportunity, the same opportunity we gave to Ukrainian families that are already here. They were able to host their families in their homes. That's what we need to do. And to be clear, there isn't at the moment any safe and legal route, any formal route for anybody from Sudan, even with family who are here, to be able to escape the danger in Sudan and come here, is there? That's right. There are no safe and legal routes for refugees to come to the UK unless they're from Ukraine. Mm. In fact, I, I met with um, two teenagers this week from Ukraine. They're part of our youth council at Sanctuary Foundation. And they were saying, look, we love the reception that we've had, but the UK's response to refugees shouldn't be based on the colour of people's skins. Uh, it should be based on need. And, and there are no routes. If you're from Afghanistan, you can't come here at the moment. The route is closed, uh, partly because we haven't sorted out the accommodation in hotels. It's a tragedy what's been happening there. But with the Sudanese people, they're saying, look, we're not asking for hotels. We're asking, please let us put people up in our homes. We're ready and willing. A mucky business with Tim Farron. We're talking to Dr. Krish Kandaya. Uh, Chris, you talked about uh, the Sanctuary Foundation. Tell us a little bit about what its work involves. So we're a tiny organisation. There's three people in my organisation. We're a catalyst. Uh, I studied chemistry a long, long time ago, and catalysts are small amounts of a compound that make bigger reactions happen. And so our job really is to help civil society, churches, other faith groups play their part in responding to crisis. Uh, I had the privilege of working um, with refugees from Afghanistan and before that helping groups come uh, from Hong Kong and get a warm reception here in the UK. And so we're working across civil society, we're advising and, and supporting government when they do something positive like a Ukraine scheme. We encourage them to do more when it comes to other groups. Uh, we also work with business and the academy. and We're about bringing everybody together, all hands on deck, so we can better support refugees and, and demonstrate the incredible hospitality that we know is already out there in the British public and just make it possible to offer that to other groups. And so that leads me to ask you really what you think individuals and churches, Christians together and on their own, can do to make a difference in this area. I think we have already started fantastically with this historic response to Ukraine. 
you know, individuals have opened their homes, churches have wrapped around uh, refugee groups as a, a refugee lunch that happens every week in, in my town. And it welcomes particularly Ukrainians. That's the largest group that we have here. Uh, we've done a fantastic job. I think we also need to use our voices and speak up for those that haven't received that same welcome. And so we're all about telling great stories and being a positive influence to government, not trying to nag them, not trying to tell them off, not trying to uh, character assassinate anyone, but just show there are good solutions to the problems that are out there. And so, for example, on Thursday, we're taking a petition to Downing Street and it's been signed by loads of Sudanese families who want to open their homes. And that's something that we as Christians can do. We can help amplify the voices of other people and give them the same opportunities that have been offered to Ukrainians. So people could follow on that work, that presentation of the petition by writing to their member of parliament, say, look, these people are clamoring to be able to take family members and be able to be part of the solution. I wonder That's if right. we could, uh, in the few moments we've got left, just move on to one of the other many hats that you wear. <laughs> um, so you're the chair of the Adoption and Special Guardianship Leadership Board. You're invited to do that by the Secretary of State for Education. You're an adoptive parent, and you're clearly very, very passionate about that, loving your family and also encouraging other people to do something similar. Tell us about that work. Well, we had three children in three years, and I thought we were done, right? I thought that was us done. And then my wife says, you know what, I think we've got capacity to care for some more children. I said, great idea for other people. Um, you know, that that's not us. And then three things happened to me. Uh, one was some friends of mine in their 60s became foster parents. And I thought, oh, wow, if, if they could do that in their 60s, maybe I could do that in my 30s. Second thing was I became aware of all the stats of what happens, sadly, to many children who age out of our foster care system. There are wonderful counterexamples of people that really have uh, led a really impactful and, and, and um, hugely significant life, but too many young people age out of care mm. and then they end up in our homeless population, our prison population, or those who have been exploited, sexually exploited particularly. And I thought, you know, we, we need to be working further upstream, not just catching people when the system's already, you know, chewed them up and spat them out. Let's work further upstream when it's a three-year-old or a six-year-old looking for a loving family. And the third thing that happened to me, is occupational hazard that happens to many, many Christians, God spoke to me through the Bible. Mm. The Bible was so full of God's heart of compassion for the vulnerable. And he specifically mentions the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. And those three groups have become really important to me. And, you know, we're working with strangers through the refugees. We're working uh, with orphans. The Bible just literally means someone who isn't living under the protection of their father or mother, I would add. And so that that's children in the care system and the widow. Well, we're seeing so many vulnerable young women and old women because of the war in Ukraine. So all three are really huge opportunities for us right now. So uh, I was working as the chair of the Adoption and Special Guardianship Leadership Board. The government, in its wisdom, decided we don't need one of those anymore. Mm. So there is no independent body that's really advising, supporting or encouraging um, how we help children in the care system at the moment. And that's something I'm hoping will change in the future. And that's troubling, isn't it? Because obviously the situation out there for young people who need a family and people who may be willing to become adoptive or foster parents, um, that's a hugely challenging situation. So how would you now informally advise government? In terms of the, the current situation, what would you say the state of, it, of the situation is in terms of the need? And what simple things could government do to make a difference? And what could we then do to encourage them to do that? That's a big question, Tim. I'll give you the quickest answer I can. <laughs> so so I, I think we just need to prioritise this. There has been a massive care review uh, and the response to it has been relatively lukewarm and tepid. I think there's we need to be more ambitious for children. A lot of the systems that we built are built around what foster parents want or what adoptive parents want and not necessarily about what children need. We need mm. to focus the system around the needs of children. And I think that means more early intervention that support families earlier. Family hubs are a good start, but there's way more that we need to be doing to give families the support they need. So maybe those children won't need to come into care in the first place. I think the second area, and the government has 
first done a reasonable job on this is supporting kinship care. Mm. So if my my wife and I were not able to look after our children, the first people we'd want to look after our kids are my sister or my wife's sisters. So let's support those arrangements. A lot of people are being pushed into poverty by taking on their grandchildren at a time when they weren't expecting to. Mm. I think foster care is a huge, huge challenge. We have not inspired a new generation to come forward for foster care. And we haven't adequately supported foster carers. So we don't have enough foster carers coming forward. And those that do end up becoming foster carers often drop out because it's really tough and they're not getting the support they need. And finally, adoption. We need to flip the narrative. Adoption is not just a way for families to get children. Right. And that, that's how it's been framed. It's all often about people who can't have their own children being able to find a way to have children through adoption. The problem with that is we often end up recruiting loads of people who don't actually want the children that are in the care system. They're holding out for younger children, children mm -hmm. that aren't in sibling groups, children that don't have additional needs. We need to flip the narrative and make this about adoption is about finding families for children. And that means all sorts of us could step forward. Single people, married people, people that don't have children yet, people that have a few already could add to their homes through more children. So that's the narrative shift that we need. And we need really big ambition to make that happen. Krish, wise and challenging stuff. Really, really grateful to you um, on all those issues we discussed in the brief period we've we've had with you. But you're a, you're a great blessing in all that you do, and we're really grateful that you've given us some of your time today. Thanks, Tim. You you are an inspiration. Thanks for being a public Christian and for making brave choices and speaking up for what needs to be spoken up for. So it's really really good to speak to you. Each week, we give you the opportunity for you to ask any question you'd like about this mucky business of politics. It may be how an aspect of this world impacts us Christians who work within it, or maybe there's a particular issue that you're struggling to make sense of. Well, I'd love to hear from you and attempt an answer. So please drop me an email to farron at premier.org.uk. And there's a strong chance I'll be answering it on an episode over the next few weeks. Well, this week, Beth from the Scottish Borders has been in touch and she asks the following. She says... How do we in politics and in wider society properly debate sensitive issues in a way which is safe for people concerned, but also doesn't discount different arguments and perspectives? I'm asking this question from Scotland. We have the Gender Recognition and Reform Bill and the abortion buffer zones currently being debated and where opposing views are considered real threats for both sides. It's a great and very timely question, really, Beth. I think the language of people feeling personally threatened, almost physically threatened, susceptible to harm as a result of a debate seems to be a relatively recent development, something in the last 10 or 20 years, certainly. I think that we obviously have to protect people from being bullied and persecuted. And so language and words absolutely do count. It's not just protecting people from physical harm. We need to make sure that the debate takes place in a way which is respectful and is not whipping up the potential violence or discrimination. But at the same time, I think in a free society, the idea that opinions can be harmful is something we should be a bit suspicious about. I personally think as a Christian, that if we think every human being is made in the image of God and carries ultimate dignity, then we need to ensure that those human beings with their opinions are afforded that level of dignity. And there will be some extreme um, examples where we would want to draw the line. But I think having differing views on gender, differing views on abortion, what we do about buffer zones, these are legitimate things to discuss. As Elizabeth Oldfield says very, very wisely, we're in a time where the reaction we have to people who have a different and challenging point of view these days seems to be hostility and defensiveness. We need to replace that with curiosity. So why is it do you think that? And that curiosity will never be satisfied unless we invite people to share their opinions. And whilst we might find their opinions horrific sometimes or troubling at other times, we surely have to treat the individual who has those opinions as somebody created by God and bearing great dignity and worth hearing. If you have a question for Tim, email farron at premier.org.uk. Well, let's close our time together in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your creation that it is your awesome creation and that we are charged 
as the apex of your creation, as those which are made in the image of God, uh, to care for it. Forgive us that we don't. And one area in which we don't is in the quality of the water in and around our country. We pray for wisdom and for justice for all of us, that we might act in ways which are gracious but effective in changing the way that we steward uh, those waterways, that we would repent and repent in practice by making things better. And Lord, we pray also for the outcome of the G7 summit, as the Prime Minister uh, reveals to the country what his part in that was. We pray in particular for those countries and their ongoing support for Ukraine. We pray for justice in Ukraine. Uh, we pray that you would uh, ensure that the aggressor fails and the victim is liberated. And we pray that you would in particular strengthen your church, your people within Ukraine, uh, that they would stand firmly for you and they'll be a great witness at this time. And finally, we pray just as we have as a country uh, met the needs of many of those who fled Ukraine. We also think about, as Chris Kandaya helps us to, um, those people from Sudan who flee from the violence there. Uh, may we as a country be wise and generous in how we relate to people fleeing that war zone, that injustice, and give us uh, the ability to make sacrifices personally as a country to do the right thing. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's show. Don't forget, you can catch up on past episodes, which feature interviews with party leaders, former government ministers and MPs from all the major parties. Just search for A Mucky Business on your chosen podcast provider or head to premierchristianradio.com forward slash A Mucky Business. 